Showcase Sundays today on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. And now, with the conclusion of this week's Sonic Summerstock Playhouse, Mr. David Alt. Welcome back to Sonic Summerstock Playhouse 13. If you could please take your seats, I'm David Alt. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Thanks. It is my great pleasure to have you direct your attention to the microphone across from me at downstage right and our guest for Act 2. From the Narada Radio Company, Mr. Pete Lux. Now, from approximately coast to coast, it's the Bob and Ray Show. Yes, here we are back again with another exciting lineup of interesting people and unusual events. Brought to you in part by the National Parks Association, which has asked us to make the following announcement. Will tourists and campers please stop throwing things into the Grand Canyon? The Grand Canyon is your canyon. It's the deepest canyon we have. But it will cease to be the deepest canyon we have if tourists and campers keep throwing things into it. And now a word from Ranger Horace Liversidge of the Park Service. Folks, I'm just a grizzled old forest ranger who's grown gray in the National Park Service. The Grand Canyon is my baby. I love it like a son. I've grown up with it. At night, I walk to the top of the canyon and look down into it. Can't see nothing, but I know what's there. A hole. Mile deep hole. Now, folks, if you keep throwing things into it, pretty soon it's going to get all choked up. Twon't be a mile deep no more. Twon't be a hole no more. So, folks, don't throw things into the Grand Canyon no more. This is grizzled old ranger Horace Liversidge thanking you from the bottom of his canyon. <coughs> Heart. That was grizzled old ranger Horace Liversidge of the National Park Service. Thank you, grizzled. If you want to help in this great campaign to preserve our natural wonders, use the litter cans on your city sidewalks. Don't throw things in the Grand Canyon. And now, the Burnside Corporation, celebrating its Golden Jubilee year in bankruptcy, brings you another episode in the adventures of Fern Ockfeet, sickly whale oil processor, the heartwarming story of a typical Eskimo co-ed from UCLA, who seeks a new and more meaningless life in the wilds of Alaska. As our scene opens today, Fern has just been released on bail while she awaits her trial for auto theft. She's busily carving a pagan idol out of a walrus tusk in her isolated cabin when Officer Wishmiller of the Alaska State Highway Patrol enters. Oh, it's you, Officer Wishmiller of the Alaska State Highway Patrol. How nice to see a familiar face. I was just busily carving a pagan idol out of a walrus tusk in my isolated cabin here. Well, I'm glad you found some way to take your mind off your problems, Fern. I'm sorry I can only stay a minute, but I just wanted to stop in and give you a piece of advice. Well, you can just leave it there on the table, and I'll look at it as soon as I finish my carving. If I don't get this pagan idol in shape to face it toward Anchorage by sundown, it won't do a bit of good. Fern, I can't leave the advice I want to give you on the table. I didn't write it down. Well, I guess I can knock off for a minute to hear you out, even though I'm not legally obligated to let you waste my time until after our forthcoming marriage. Well, I understand that, Fern, but this is for your own good. I hear the DA's got an open and shut case against you on that auto theft charge, and, well, I think you'd better forfeit your bail and leave the state while there's still time. Well, that doesn't sound like a very practical idea to me, Officer Wishmiller. My bail was $500, and that pile of junk I stole wasn't worth more than 75 clams at the outside. I think I'd be coming out loser all the way around if I just blew my investment and blew. Fern, you've let yourself get so wrapped up in the economics of this thing that you forgot a conviction could put you in stir for five years. Well, I admit it's a point worthy of some consideration. I suppose I could go back to UCLA and hide out for a while. 
So many of the students there are on the lam that they'd never notice one more. That's a great idea. And even if they did find you, you'd be in another state and could fight extradition. No. If I recall, I fought him once and he knocked me cold in the third round. I certainly don't want any more of that. Fern, I think you have extradition confused in your mind with Muhammad Ali. But we don't have time to straighten you out. Just toss a few things in a suitcase and you can still catch the 5.30 businessman's economy flight to Los Angeles. Well, I guess maybe that would be the best thing to do, even though I'm too much of a muddy thinker to know for sure. I just assume you'll join me there at your earliest convenience. Well, that's hard to say, Fern. I'm not sure the Alaska State Highway Patrol has a branch in Los Angeles. But if it does... You can bet your boots I'll pull every string I can to put through a transfer. And no matter how long it takes, I'll be waiting. Will Fern's plan to catch the 5.30 businessman's economy flight succeed, even though she's not a businessman? Can Officer Wishmiller tolerate the loneliness of being the only Alaska State Highway Patrolman on duty in California? And why hasn't the mysterious owner of the car Fern stole noticed that it's missing yet? Join us next time when we'll hear Fern say... I don't have any idea what I'm doing here. I didn't even know that Alaska Airlines had a flight to Leningrad. Well, that's in the next exciting episode of Fern Akvik, Sickly Whale Oil Processor. Now, an important message from the makers of Einbinder Flypaper... Friends, despite our rigid quality control system at the Einbinder factory, several thousand rolls of flypaper have been released to the public with stickum that could become defective under certain conditions. If you've bought flypaper recently that bears the manufacturer's code number 38293 or 38294, return it to the plant for a new stickum at once. And while you're waiting for it to be returned to you, Better protect your family by going out and buying some new flypaper. When you do, be sure you insist on Genuine Einbinder, the brand you've gradually grown to trust over the course of three generations. By the way, there's still time to order Einbinder's beautiful lapel pin. It's a lifelike replica of a giant horsefly, a pin that makes an ideal accessory for either ladies or gentlemen, with all eight of its legs painted in gleaming black enamel. The wings are a lovely transparent mother of pearl, and there is a simulated emerald set right in the insect's hindquarters that's sure to gain compliments from all your friends. You'll want to have one of those gorgeous pins for yourself and several more to give as gifts for almost any occasion. So stock up on Einbinder flypaper now and send in your proof of purchase stickers. But be sure you insist on genuine Einbinder, the flypaper you've gradually grown to trust over the course of three generations. Now it's time for one of our most popular features. We'd like to chat with the more interesting members of our studio audience whenever we can. And we pick this gentleman, Ken Vose, because we learned it's his birthday. Welcome, Ken. <laughs> That's right, Bob. It is. Happy birthday. Thanks. What's your line of work, Ken? I'm kind of a troubleshooter, Bob. I work as a liaison between management and employees. I see to it that the combined efforts of each side produce the maximum result. Sounds important. Do you have a formula for doing this? I think so. I feel that a successful business is like a happy family, Bob. No one member can make it work. It's pulling together, sharing the load, teamwork. Sounds like you know what you're talking about, all right. By the way, what do you want for your birthday? I think this may surprise you, Bob. Oh? Believe it or not, I wouldn't care if I didn't get a single gift for my birthday. What do you think of that? Well, I'm taken aback. Why is that, sir? I'll tell you why. I don't need any gifts. I've already got the best gift a man could ask for. A lovely wife, four lovely children. What more could I possibly want? You aren't interested in material things, huh? No, sir. Well, that's certainly refreshing, but... No, I mean it. <laughs> Gosh, I just thought how stuffy I must sound. I mean, sure, I'd accept a gift. That's common sense. But on the other hand, what better gift is there than to come home to a lovely wife and four lovely children after the toils of the day are behind you? Well, I've got to admit... No question about it. Beats any gift I know. And it all adds up to one thing. Teamwork. Pulling together. You know, Ken, I feel clean just talking to you. Let me shake your hand. Sure. 
Gosh, I ought to call Sally and the kids and tell them what a nice guy I met here. Thanks. Uh, where are they, Ken? They're out in Tacoma, Washington. That's where our home is. Gee, I know how you must miss them. Are you here on a business trip? No, my company has more or less placed me here on a permanent basis. Been here for, let's see, 11 years now. I have an apartment here in New York. Well, how often do you get to see the wife and kids, Ken? Not as much as I'd like to, Bob. It's quite cold out there. Do they come to New York to see you often? Well, they may have. I'm not in my apartment all the time, and it's possible they could have missed me. But I never got any messages, so I don't think they came here. Well, thank you for talking with us. I think we can all learn a lesson from you. Sure thing. And now, it's time for another story of drama and tense emotion. A tale well designed to keep you in... Anxiety. Here with us again to set the stage for our latest thriller is the noted author and world traveler, Commander Neville Putney. Commander, I'm sure you've reached into your amazing file and brought forth another tale well designed to keep us all in... Anxiety. Oh, indeed I have, young man, indeed. Uh, today's hair-raising yarn concerns two promising young bank tellers named Warren Huey and Weldon Kleinbeiter. Both have received considerable praise from their branch manager for displaying the ability to make change and add figures correctly. It seemed as if promotion for the pair were almost certain. Then one terrible mistake brought them face to face with... Anxiety! <laughs> The two heroes of today's drama had struck up a casual friendship with one of the bank's wealthy clients, who chanced to be a president of the Amalgamated Stepladder Company. It was he who tipped them off that Amalgamated was about to unveil a new model that would glow in the dark. Warren and Weldon saw a chance to double their money overnight by embezzling funds from the bank to buy Amalgamated stock. They were certain they could replace the money before it was missed. But as Weldon returned to his desk after phoning the stockbroker to sell it at a big profit, his eyes were downcast. Warren noticed immediately. Weldon, I noticed immediately that your eyes are downcast. But you don't need to feel bad if we failed to double our money overnight. I'll gladly settle for a gain of 50%, just so we can sell out and replace what we embezzled before Mr. Prouty notices the shortage. Well, I wish it were possible to settle for a gain of 50%, or even to break even, Warren, but when I phoned our broker and told him to sell Amalgamated Stepladder, he said he couldn't give it away at any price. Good gravy, Weldon. I don't understand. This is the day when the new Amalgamated Glow-in-the-Dark model was to be introduced. Did our broker say why that development had caused the stock to go down? No, he just said that Amalgamated Stepladder had dropped as far as it could go and that we should have known it was a risky investment when we bought it. Good gravy, Weldon. It's small wonder that you returned to face me with downcast eyes. We're in a real pickle. True, it's also a fine kettle of fish. Well, I think it goes without saying that this is a fine kettle of fish, but the thing that raises it to the level of a real pickle is the fact that we didn't just lose our own money, Weldon. We've embezzled funds from the bank, and we'll go to the hooskow for sure when the shortage is discovered. Yes, there's no doubt about that, Warren. Buying stock in Amalgamated Stepladder seemed like a surefire way to get rich quick. Instead, that one little mistake has wiped out two promising careers. Now we'll be packed away in the Huskow until we both rot. Boy, oh boy, Commander. That story really had me perched on the edge of my chair. But you can't just leave us all in anxiety this way. Did Weldon and Warren throw themselves on the mercy of the court and somehow miraculously escape a long term in prison? Well, no. As I recall, they merely sold their amalgamated stepladder stock at a profit of several hundred thousand dollars. So, of course, that enabled them to replace the bank funds they'd stolen and still have plenty left over to retire to the French Riviera. But I don't understand, Commander. In your story, Weldon and Warren's broker told them that Amalgamated Stepladder had dropped as far as it could go and that he couldn't even give it away. Oh, my no, young man. That was only a momentary misunderstanding. 
You see, Weldon dialed a wrong number and reached some house painter by mistake instead of his stockbroker, and as chance would have it, the painter had just tumbled off an amalgamated stepladder at work. So, in a fit of pique, he naturally answered Weldon's inquiry about Amalgamated by saying that it was worthless and risky because it had just fallen as far as it could go. Commander, that is the most ridiculous story I ever heard in my life. And I quite agree. And Weldon and Warren got a hearty chuckle out of it themselves once they discovered the silly error they'd made. I'm glad to see you find it amusing, too. <laughs> I didn't say I found it amusing, Commander. The word I used was ridiculous. And I don't think Weldon and Warren got a chuckle out of it, as you claim, because I don't think Weldon and Warren ever existed. You just made up the whole dumb thing. Why, you cheeky young blighter. You haven't the vaguest notion of what you're talking about. Now I'd suggest that you read your closing announcement before you'll find yourself in very serious trouble. Well, after that clinker, I think we're both in serious trouble but I'll try to get through this closing announcement. Friends, join us again next time when Commander Putney will again reach into his amazing file and bring forth a tale well designed to keep you in... Anxiety. Here's good news for you homemakers. You're well aware, I'm sure, that extra shiny steel ingots have been in short supply this season at your Monongahela Metal Foundry showroom. But now we're happy to say that supply has nearly caught up with the tremendous demand. You may still encounter a limit of three ingots to the customer in some scattered areas, but in most places, your Monongahela agent will be happy to sell you as many as you need to replace those old, worn-out ingots you've been forced to use during the shortage. So, stock up today while there's a good selection. And now, Search for Togetherness, the touching story of people just like yourself who struggle to overcome their misery in a small Midwestern town where the steel mill has been closed permanently. As our scene opens today, Dr. Honeycutt, the recently widowered young surgeon, is paying a surprise visit to the office of Sanford Bluedorn, Kindly editor of the Roaring Falls Advocate. Well, Dr. Honeycutt, this is a surprise visit, I must say. Yes, I was afraid that was the way it might seem to you, Sanford. And heaven knows, I'd hoped I wouldn't have to come here. Now, now, there's no need for you to feel that way, Doctor. The people in this town have been coming to me with their problems for 40 years or more. I know, uh, but I thought I was made of sterner stuff than the rest of them. However, Agatha's murder trial is scheduled to go to the jury this afternoon, as you may have heard. Yes, I've been following the case closely. And of course, my best young reporter, Lance Wakefield, is covering the case for the advocate. That's what I've come to talk to you about, Sanford. I wish you wouldn't put too much trust in the stories that young Lance Wakefield is writing about Agatha's trial. Oh, come now, Honeycutt. I know what you're thinking, but... No, I don't think you do know what I'm thinking, Sanford. I happen to be young Lance Wakefield's personal physician. That has nothing to do with this. However, I know what you're thinking. No, I'm reasonably certain that you don't know what I'm thinking, Sanford. But everyone in Roaring Falls is thinking the same thing, Honeycutt. They know that young Lance Wakefield spent four years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And they think his bitterness about that experience makes him unfit to cover Agatha's trial for the advocate. I've been thinking the same thing, Sanford, and that's what I came here to talk to you about. I was sure you would, sooner or later. Really? And yet you said that my visit here came as a surprise. Why? Oh, I don't know. Perhaps I couldn't think of anything more appropriate to say when I saw you standing there in the doorway. After all, this visit has come as something of a surprise. I guess I should have known it would. I was hoping right up until the last minute that I might be able to stay away. Nonsense, Honeycutt. There's no need to feel that way. The people in this town have been coming to me for 40 years or more. I know, but I'm supposed to be made of sterner stuff. I'm a doctor, you know. Yes, I'm aware of that. 
In fact, I believe you're the personal physician to my top young reporter, Lance Wakefield. That's right. And it's Lance Wakefield that I've come here to talk to you about. Now, Doctor, I know what you're thinking, but... No, I don't believe you do know what I'm thinking. Lance Wakefield is covering Agatha's murder trial for The Advocate, and that trial is scheduled to go to the jury this afternoon. Really? I didn't know it was going to be so soon. Lance Wakefield hasn't filed his story on the trial for the early edition yet. Sanford, I wish you wouldn't put too much trust in the stories that young Lance Wakefield is writing about Agatha's trial. That's what I came here to talk to you about. What is there to talk about? Lance Wakefield is my top reporter, so naturally I assigned him to cover Agatha's trial. I can't see that there's anything to discuss. Perhaps you're right, and I guess I'd best be going. I'm sorry to have troubled you, Sanford. Oh, no trouble at all, Doctor. I'm glad we had this little talk. Very glad indeed. And so, Dr. Honeycutt has finally revealed his true feelings about young Lance Wakefield to kindly old Sanford Bluedorn. But has the revelation come too late to save Agatha? Perhaps we'll learn more in the next exciting episode. Join us then for more touching drama on Search for Togetherness. As a public service paid for by the Philanthropic Council to make things nicer, we invite you to spend another educational session with the idol of the nation's youngsters, Mr. Science. As we look in on the modern, well-equipped laboratory today, we see that little Jimmy Schwab is just arriving to watch Mr. Science perform his latest fascinating experiment. Oh, hello there, Jimmy. You're just in time to watch me perform my latest fascinating experiment. Gee willikers, Mr. Science, I'm always fascinated by your fascinating experiments. Which one are you going to perform today? Well, Jimmy, today we're going to observe what happens when we boil water right here in the laboratory. Great day in the morning, Mr. Science. I don't understand what you're talking about. Well, it's really not as complicated as it sounds. You see, each chemical property has its own particular temperature point at which it changes from a liquid to a gas. And, loosely defined, steam is the form of gaseous vapor that water is converted into when we heat it to 212 degrees. Holy macro, Mr. Science! I don't understand that even worse than what you said the first time! Well, don't worry about it, son. I'm sure it'll all become very clear to you after you've observed today's experiment. Now, in order to see what happens when we bring water to the boiling point... We must first prepare our laboratory equipment to heat to 212 degrees. Gosh, all hemlock, Mr. Science. What's that piece of laboratory equipment you're lighting with a match? This device is called a candle, Jimmy. A candle? Holy suffering catfish! Wait till I tell all the kids at school I've seen one of those! Now, just try to keep your enthusiasm under control, boy. We still haven't gotten to the most amazing part. Watch what happens when I hold this test tube filled with water over the lighted candle. Golly Moses, Mr. Science! Nothing happened at all! Well, that's only because the water hasn't been heated quite long enough yet. Remember, I told you all chemical properties are converted from liquid to vapor once their temperature rises sufficiently. Great jumping Jehoshaphat! The water's starting to get all bubbling on top. I guess doing that instead of turning into a vapor offers conclusive proof that water's not a chemical property. Right, Mr. Science? No, that's not quite correct, Jimmy. You see, those bubbles indicate that the water is starting to boil. And now, if you look closely, you can see steam beginning to rise from the test tube. Oh, wowie two-shoes! But that stuff sure looks an awful lot like the smoke that was rising from the candle. You wouldn't try to slip me the old rubber peach just because I'm a gullible child, would you, Mr. Science? No, of course not, Jimmy. Notice how my hand gets wet when I pass it through the cloud of steam like this. And that means the vapor has converted itself back into water again. Boy, oh boy, your hand's sure wet all right, Mr. Science. I feel as though... One of nature's eternal secrets has just been unlocked before my very eyes. 
Well, that's very cleverly phrased, Jimmy, and... I'll bet this little bottle would get equally wet if I passed it through the cloud of steam. No, don't do that, Jimmy. The contents of that bottle must never be exposed to heat. Keep it away from here, boy. But I only want to see if the outside of the bottle will... Mr. Science has been brought to you as a public service paid for by the Philanthropic Council to make things nicer. Today's broadcast was the last in our current series. And so this ends another installment of the Bob and Ray Show coming to you from somewhere. All material was written by Bob Elliott and Ray Goulding and specially reenacted for the 2022 Sonic Summerstock Playhouse by Jeff Billard and Pete Lutz. Music was performed by Dr. Ross Bernhardt at the Mighty Wurlitzer Organ. Sound effects were performed remotely by Corrections Officer Philomena Ogden at the Minnesota State Penitentiary for Disgruntled Youth. Post-production and mixing were by Fernando, a barista at Pete's favorite coffee shop, Café Olé, located in historic Red Lawn. Is anybody going to mop up all this spilled coffee, Pete? And now this is Ray Goulding reminding you to write if you get work. And Bob Elliott reminding you to hang by your thumbs. audio Boris Karloff in Dance Macabre Mr. Karloff's most recent appearance at our microphone was a memorable one we recall his Armistice Day performance with a great deal of satisfaction tonight's play is of a different order a frankly melodramatic thriller by Arch Obler whose remarkable imaginings on the Lights Out program which happens to be my favorite program, have chilled millions of spines on Wednesday evenings at 12.30 during the past two years. The play was inspired by the Sanson composition of the same name, and the great French composer is one of two principal characters played tonight by Harold Vermilier. Boris Karloff in Danse Macabre. Scene, a country churchyard in provincial France, standing beside a small white headstone inscribed to the memory of my son Louis, stands Charles Camille Sanson, already known as one of the world's great composers. It is night, very late at night. As Sanson weeps over the grave of his young son, a church bell tolls in the distance. Is that you, Monsieur Sanson? <laughs> Who is it? It's I, Oh Jacques. You're out late. You're out late, my friend. Yes. Sometimes I like to walk here among the tombstones. There are many more of my old friends here than there are back in town. Ah, I know, Monsieur Sanson. It is bitter to lose someone so young. It is only when one is as old as I that death becomes a friend. Friend? The monster that took from me the thing I loved most in all the world? To you, a monster. To me, a friend. It is a difference of thought that comes to me, perhaps only because I have lived too long. Ah, the owl woods. He tells old Jacques it's time to be home. Good night, Monsieur Sponson. Good night, Jacques. Do not weep too long, monsieur. Your little one rests. And rest here in a quiet, bowered churchyard must be very sweet. 
Yes, it's sweet. <laughs> Rest, my little Louis. Why you? Why? Why you? I love you so, my little son. I was going to make beautiful songs for you to sing. And now, oh, my son. Music? Here? That can't be. And yet, yet I heard it. Oh, well, t'was in my weary head. Hmm. There it is again. You out there, fiddler, where are you? Right at your side, monsieur. <gasps> oh, do not be startled. We have met before. I know you? Yes, monsieur. You know me. Your, your pardon me, it's so dark. The moon will be out in a moment. Then you will see. The moon? You're mistaken, monsieur. There is no moon. I am never mistaken, monsieur Sanson. See? The clouds have broken. Look at me, my friend. <gasps> you! You remember me. The dark stranger. The day my son... The day your son had a most unfortunate accident. You. You were the one to pick him up. You. You held him in your arms. Yes, I held him in my arms. When you handed him to me, where did you go? Why, I'm a very busy man, monsieur. I go many places. I never had a chance to tell you how much I appreciated your help. My help. You loved that boy. He... he was my life. And without him, life is empty. It is. So you come here every night and weep by his grave. How did you know? I, too, come here every night. I never saw you. I did not wish to be seen. Ah, you, too, have a sorrow. Sorrow brings men close together. Yes. Your boy, hmm, he would have had great talent. A voice crystal clear. And now, now he is silent forever. Forever. Why go on living, Sanson? You... you said something, monsieur? You and I are very much akin. I... I'm afraid I, I don't understand. Did you not hear me play before? It... it was you? Yes, and you are the very first to hear me play. The music, so strange. I... I thought I'd heard it before. In my own mind. You had heard it, and that is why... Listen to me, Sanson. Join me tonight. In what, monsieur? You'll pardon me again. I don't understand. You said your son was all your life. You meant that? All my life. Then why go on living? Your son is at rest here. Why not join him in peace? Forever. What? What are you saying? Life has been cruel to you. She has taken from you your son. Now he's at rest, and you can rest with him. No more sorrow, no more tears. It is yours for the asking. But I am strong. There, there are many years ahead of me. Your son is waiting. But what can I do? I offer you a way. You? I've been watching you a long time, Sanson, and I want you to join me tonight. Monsieur, you said that before. Please speak plainly. You and I are weary of life. Let us take the other path. You, 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 you mean? With these. <gasps> Pistols. Yes, with pistols. They offer us release, Sanson. Release from the miseries of living. Rest for our weariness. The coward's way. No, no, no! 
We are men of will, Sanson. No, no. Peace and rest. I can't, I tell you, I can't. It would be so easy to do. Together, take the pistol in your hands. So. Pistol is cold. Life is colder. And you too will do it? Yes. You see, my hand too holds a pistol. I press it close, close up against my heart. I, 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 I never thought I would. No, 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 do not think. Do. Your little one is waiting. Your, your Louis. My Louis. Your finger curves around the trigger. You press the pistol close against your heart. Yes. Your finger tightens. Closer. Closer against the trigger. Closer. What was that? Nothing. Press the trigger, Sanson. Huh? The trigger, Sanson. Rest. Peace. But didn't you hear? A knocking from the tomb. Listen only to me. But I heard it. Listen to me. You must press the trigger. You must. Master, it is time! What voice was that? Please, press the trigger, Sanson, quickly, quickly. You first, then I. You cannot fail me. You cannot. Master, it is time. Time for the dance. What madness is this? These voices, they, they, they come from the grave. You must do it. You must press the trigger. You must join me. You said you would. Oh, my plans. I've waited so long for you. Do it. Fire, Sanson. Fire. Master, we wait. It is from beneath the ground. I cannot fail. I cannot. Hear us, Master. It is time. Play for us, Master. Play. Play. To whom do they speak? They are the dead. And yet I hear them. Tell me, you fiddler, to whom do they speak? Press the trigger, mortal. Press. Too late. I must play for the dance. So be it. Do you hear me, white ones? So be it. Arise. Arise. It's time for the dance. <laughs> The graves, they open. The dead, arise. We are oh, here, Master. Master. Play. 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 Dance, my white ones, dance. Come, Sansa, dance, dance. Terribly, he plays and they dance. Bones, dead men, dancing. <laughs> what goes on? You fiddler, you spoke to me of peace, and now this? Oh, unhappy dancers! <laughs> Dance, my white one! Dance to my tune! <laughs> Fiddler, who are you? Does it matter who I am, Sanson? Oh, listen to me. If you take your life, you will be as my dancers are. A happy rattle of bones, a grinning joy, dancing each night like those out there. You? Death? <laughs> oh, how quick you are, my friend. Is rest. Ah, but there are two kinds of death, Sanson. One kind, gentle, a death who gives the empty silence of rest to those who face life and fight to the end. But then, 
there is the other play. For those who listen to me, happy dancers to my music forever. Come, Sansa, the pistol, draw in the dance. No, no, no. Oh, my head. Stop talking to me. Watch, Sansa, watch. My white ones will dance so well for me. Listen to my music. You must. You will join the dance. Dance, my white ones. Faster! Faster! Zig-zig! <laughs> Death knocks at the tomb with a rhythmic feel. Death fiddles it on in a horrible tune. The wind of winter whistles, dark is the night. Groans come from the linden trees. White skeletons come out across the darkness. They run, they leap each under his shroud. Zig and zig, zig and zig, each miserable sinner. Oh, come, Sanson. Join the dance. <laughs> All of a sudden, they leave their world. They thrust each other back to their graves. They must. The cock has crowed. Quick, Sanson, quickly. Join them. Use the pistol. Join them before it is too late. Dawn is coming. Join them, man. No, never, never. Look at them, unhappy bones. No rest, no peace. I'll never join you, never. Better life with all its sorrow than that. I tell you, I'll live out my life to the end. Ah, but I've not lost Sanson with you. I will never lose. Though you may deny me, you will never forget my music. It will sing. It will ring in your head, hour after hour, day after day, till you can bear it no longer. You will write it note for note, measure for measure, and all the world will hear my voice. Farewell, song song. You see, I am still victorious. <laughs> 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 Audio. This is mutual. This is mutual. Please join me in thanking Pete Lutz and Jeffrey Billard and Mutual's United Artists of Audio for that stellar performance. And as we sweep up the spotlights for this week, please join us back here at the Playhouse next week for another final command performance from both Soul Twin Audio and the Nevada Radio Company. Until then, I'm David Alt, your host, and from myself and our announcer Jack Ward, good night from Halifax, Nova Scotia.
And that concludes this week's performance of the Sonic Summerstock Playhouse. All productions, features, characters and scripts presented in the Playhouse belong strictly to their respective copyright holders and no copyright infringement is assumed or intended. The Sonic Summerstock Playhouse is part of the Sonic Society and a proud member of the Mutual Audio Network. And any shows that continue their run must receive express permission from all parties involved. Join us next week for another new classic. With thanks to our announcer, Jack Ward, I'm your host, David Ault. Good night. Hi, this is John Bell. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my podcast, Bells in the Battery, I usually surpass a thousand words. Why does he? But for every episode, there is also a picture. You mean that itty bitty picture that you see when you bring up the episode? Yes, that's called a thumbnail. They're drawn on thumbnails? <sighs> but now you can see all the thumbnail pictures in large format by going to the Bells in the Bat Free Gallery. Just go online to thebatfree.com. That's T H E B A T F R Y dot com. And click on Gallery. That's G A L L E. I think they can figure that out. You'll see all the pictures for all the episodes that were created by Jeff Music, along with other guest artists like the Lavalier Brothers and famous animation director Dan Reba. Oh, well, he knows one celebrity and he really wants you to know about it. You'll also see lots of fan art over the years and a few surprises so when you're in the mood for a picture instead of a thousand words especially his words, words go to thebatfree.com and click on gallery and be sure to clean your thumbnails before viewing